We create, view, and share data every day. And an easy way to see this is with photos. So, for example, if you're curious what it looks like up here, I can actually take a photo. So everybody do like a goofy pose or wave or something like that. Ready? So there's an event. I documented it, and I can share it. Now that was a selfie photo that I took, and a lot of people think selfies are selfish, right? But what if in the future could sharing our selfies actually save us? That's what we're going to be talking about today. And in terms of sticking with photos, this is the most important photo of the presentation for me. It's my family, and we can use photos to remember important events like this, but also silly and embarrassing things. For example, these are the best graduate photos I have. So my housemate, <laughs> it's pretty bad. And we can actually use data, so we can pull out a face, we can actually put it on T-shirts for April Fools. So, <laughs> yes, Jacksonism. <laughs> And so we share data every day, and we interact with it to satisfy our curiosity. But what about our medical data? Do you, have you ever accessed or used or shared your medical data? Do you even know what data the hospitals have on you? Well, for me, this is what my medical photo looked like last summer. It's an extremely large cancerous brain tumor.、It、actually, took up about. 10% of my brain, and this is actually a one-to-one -one size、um, copy of that tumor. And yes, it's in my frontal left lobe. And a lot of people think that's where the personality is kept. So if I'm boring today, it's because they cut out the exciting parts. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's.、Uh, we, <laughs> they're keeping me on a tight time here, so I'm going to cruise.、Um, I'm going to go back to that initial photo and actually show you what it looks like as a medical selfie. So we zoom in. There's my repaired skull to my brain, to the MRI scans, and down to my actual surgery. This is my brain. If we go down to the cellular level, we can actually get down and see the IDH1 mutant protein, and that's right here. And the genetic code behind it, there's a single point mutation. It's a G to an A. That's what drove the primary mutation behind my tumor. So, could sharing our medical selfies actually save us? There's huge benefits for patients, for hospitals, for medical science as a whole, and I'm going to tell you today why I think the future is in patient-centric healthcare, and why if we share our selfies, it could save us. But first, let me rewind and explain why I'm here.、Um, I'm a very curious fellow, and even when growing up, we're, we're all curious when we're young. And I was even looking at my brain when I was 10 years old. All right. That curiosity took me to MIT, where I'm currently a PhD candidate, and I work under Professor Nary Oxman and David Wallace, and I work on how to make things. So, I work on all kinds of things, ranging from buildings to bacteria. This is actually a 3D printer for a house, so we can actually print with not only concrete and insulation, but we can also print with metal. We can print with glass. We can actually get down to the micro scale and actually use it to control biology. So we can 3D print microfluidics, and we can house specialized bacteria in them. And that's where the future is. It's designing biology. So that's where my curiosity took me professionally. But that's not what this talk is about. This is a personal story. So I'm a huge dork, and a lot of people in this audience know that. And <laughs> I always try to collect as much data, especially on myself. And so, in 2007, I was curious about my brain, and I volunteered for a research study. Where they scanned me, and the scan was fine, but when we looked at the data, there was something else—an abnormality. If you look at the top right corner, you can see it's a little bit lighter. We didn't know what that was. I had it rechecked by doctors in 2007 and 2010. No real changes. I continued living my life. I didn't have symptoms. I felt normal. Then last summer, I started to smell a very faint vinegar smell for a few seconds a day, and after about the third day, I remembered. That abnormality is kind of close to my smell center, so I went to the doctors, asked for a rescan. They weren't concerned. They booked it for a month later. This is what it looked like. So three weeks later, I had it surgically removed by an amazing medical team、uh, led by Dr. Ino Kioka at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And get this, it was an awake 10-hour brain surgery. So they kept me awake so that I could talk like this with my head open, so that the language center wouldn't be damaged. So. Because I want to know what's happened to me and collect data, I asked if it could be videotaped, and they said sure. <laughs> so, 
I'm going to ask you guys, are you curious to view it? Yes. All right, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Good. So close your eyes if this is too graphic, because it is going to be graphic, all right? This is a 10-hour brain surgery in 30 seconds. I'm awake. They're going to make the primary cut, and they're going to have me talking. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear how I met my incredible girlfriend with my head open. Great. Talk to us again. Uh, I'm not ready in uh, a class of 2019. Sorry to design class in MIT. And here you can see the rest of the surgery, and it was honestly the most surreal experience to feel them inside the machinery of my brain while I was lying there awake. <laughs> that, that applause is for the doctors, because I really didn't do anything. I just lay there. That's for the doctors. This was my brain before and after. And because it was such an incredible medical team, I was very lucky, actually, as well. Three days later, I was back on campus. Um, I had side effects, terrible sleep loss. I've lost a good chunk of my sense of smell. But doing well, and I, I'm on, I did proton radiation at Mass General Hospital, and I followed up, and I'm on a year of chemotherapy. My next round of chemo starts on Monday. So this is a very real and current thing for me. But what did I learn? And this is, you know, as a, as a dork, this is what I like. So I dove into the data, and I'm not going to dive into the details, but it was over 100 gigabytes of data. It was not easy to access, it was not easy to understand or to share, but it had incredible benefits. For example, I actually got to access my brain tumor. And I'm going to show you, this is actually a slice of my tumor. I was able to actually cut it, stain it, and image it. See my own cancer. Now, going down to the cellular level, and yes, this is a selfie. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> looking at the genetic uh, mutations behind is actually very valuable. I can then start to know what clinical trials for new inhibitor drugs might work for my specific mutations. I can make personalized medical decisions. And if I can share this data, other patients and other doctors can learn what decisions I made and the results that occurred. They can then plan out their own map, all right? So I could also take this data and I could visualize it in interesting ways. So 3D printing. Um, I was able, actually, in, in the proton accelerator to take selfies using protons, which are fired at over 600 million kilometers per hour at my face. And with multi-material 3D printing, we could actually look at new surgical tools. Imagine, in the future, medical students could actually dissect themselves. Right? <laughs> it's crazy. And this right here is actually my skull. And this is actually a one-to-one -one scale representation. And if you want to see how the surgery went, they basically pulled out this part of the skull, and then they pulled out this tumor over 10 hours. So imagine, if you go to the hospital, you get your x-rays, and you get this if you pay your $50, you know? The, the, <laughs> Right? I made these as uh, Christmas tree ornaments for my family. It was pretty funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, the data was fascinating, and it was very interesting, and actually very incredibly important for medical decisions. But the most important lesson I learned was a question, and it was why do patients have the least access to their own data? We're put last in line. I found there's barriers everywhere. Even simple ones, like MRIs comes in dozens of CDs without tools to interact and share or use. The data is, is very complex. Hundreds of pages of technical reports and forms. Hospitals can't even communicate with each other due to the complexity many times. And there's many legal gray zones of what I can access and what I can share. For example, I still don't have access to my whole genome sequence. So there was a study done by my hospital and by my university. And they asked me if I would donate part of my brain tumor tissue to get it sequenced to help science. Of course, I was thrilled. And there's a, the, on the informed consent form, it listed a way for patients to actually request data. It said you could. So I was thrilled. And right now, my doctors and my university colleagues can see my genome. But I still can't. I'm still waiting. Uh, it's been a two-month legal process. I'm still waiting for the answer. Why can they see my future and not me? Why can't I share that with the world to help improve medical science? So I wanted to share the data, and I couldn't find many good tools online, so I put it on a website. And this was originally for friends and family, many who are in this audience. And it was great. I was able to tell people what was going on, and 
It actually resulted in an MIT professor inviting me to give a patient perspective talk during one of his lectures. The response was incredible, and it actually resulted in a New York Times article being published on April 1st, which coincidentally is one of my favorite holidays. <laughs> it's just true. And it resulted in over a thousand emails that day. Thousands more in the weeks to follow. And they were from patients, from doctors, and from researchers. And they all said, this matters. So I did 49 days of chemo and protons. <clears throat> And on my first day after treatment, I got invited to President Obama's precision medicine announcements. And I'll be very honest, I was very worried about setting off the Geiger counters in the way to the White House because I went straight from the hospital to the White House on my first day post-treatment. I had to, of course, document it with another terribly embarrassing selfie. And yes, <laughs> I was very excited, right? It's pretty amazing. But it encouraged me to keep asking this question, why can't we have a hospital share button? And it wouldn't just benefit me, it would actually benefit friends and family with understanding, getting second opinions. Doctors could have engaged patients, which results in better care. Scientists could have data with context. And hospitals could use the feedback to optimize. We could have input and output. We could make healthcare a two-way street. To show you that my partial brain is not completely crazy, there's some precedents. Open Notes was a project done in three major US hospitals. They gave patients full access to doctor's notes, and in the course of one year, they found 99% wanted continued access, four out of five would choose a future provider based on having access, and 70% reported taking better care of themselves. All of these hospitals expanded these programs, and none of the doctors dropped out. What about sharing? Would you share? And it could be anything. It could be blood work. Could you share your x-rays? Well, if we look at Apple Research Kit, which is a recent platform, an open platform launched to share data with medical researchers, 50,000 users joined in the first week. Over 75% opted in to share their data with any credible researcher. So if the tools are simple, if they're interactive, people will share. I always get asked this question, is too much data damaging? And yes, all data has liabilities, and it's extremely important that privacy is kept under patient control. If you don't want to share anything, then you don't share anything. But if you want to access, if you want to use, if you want to share your data, we need a voice. We need patients as partners. So we need access that's patient-centric and is clear. The first step is access. We can push for an open API. An API is an application programming interface. What that is is like a key to your data, which where you can then send it to third parties and actually control it. And if this happens, we could then have Google Maps for health. We could have Facebook for health. We could have Dropbox for health. We could use capitalism to democratize medical data. And the possibilities are incredible. We could cure diseases by sharing. And for you personally, your watch could diagnose you, could save your life. And for medical science, we're not talking a million-person study, we're talking a billion. And personally, data generates support. And this is often lost on researchers, but I can tell you from personal experience, support can be the most important medicine. <sighs> Jeez. A lot of friends and family on it, and they, <clears throat> they all sent videos right before my surgery, and this is what I got to see, including some of my favorite TV shows. You'll get a kick out of this. Happy brain surgery, Steve. Hey, Steve, it's Jimmy Kimmel. We hope you get better. T-shirts. These? Number one and number two. Steve, dance. Pool time two. Yeah. And that, what'd you get there? Happy brain surgery to you. Happy brain surgery to you. So I need to thank everybody, and I wanted to end with my family dancing because their dancing during the toughest times kept me dancing during protons. And so, it's not over. <laughs> I have to start juggling my brain tumors, kill time.
there's one thing to take away, it's to stay curious. Stay curious about yourself. Ask your doctor about your data. Think about sharing it. Think about sharing the idea of sharing it. And I'm going to end on a very, very personal note. But first, I want to thank the people who saved my life, friends and family, medical doctors, the groups who are working towards patient data access, <clears throat> the researchers I work with, and the references. I'm going to end. <laughs> I'm going to end on a very personal statement. So put yourselves in my shoe. Shoes, you're normal. Then they tell you in three weeks they're going to cut out 10% of your brain. I, hardest part for me was telling friends and family. So I wrote a final email before the surgery. These are the last three <coughs> sentences from that email. Perspective is everything, and switching shoes yields the most powerful thoughts. Family and friends, many who are here, are what remains when the world blurs. I'm going to let you read that one on your own. <laughs> Jesus Christ. One more to go. <laughs> and this was the final sentence in that email. The world is a lovely, splendid, and fascinating place. But most of all, to me, it's beautifully curious. So thank you, and to this audience with friends and family, thank you for everything. <laughs>